just trying to save my mother. Maybe you're looking for a father figure, so you then can't abandon him. Girl, is this what we're standing in? Maybe I'm just being paranoid. Conversations that I had with Floyd. It's just so hard to gain acceptance of these dreams that I had destroyed. If you picture me as a boy, could you find some compassion then? All the pain that I had endured, let me down in that path of sin. Sinking back in that black hole there. Fear is here, it's a pathogen. Powerlessness of your darkness, well, it's a time off the traps of sin. Somehow now come back to then. Somehow I seen it all before. Love, I knew it was never fair. I may care to go call it war. Woman, I got this bleeding hot. It's leaking out all on the floor. Maybe that's just a greedy pot. Cause it only makes me want it more. This is like a revolver. I can't let this shit go. This episode of Dopey is brought to you by our friends at Aloe Recovery, located in sunny Southern California, in Malibu, and Silver Lake. And Aloe was created by our great friend, Bob Forrest, and his friends, Evan, Bob, and Jared, to create a place where addicts and alcoholics are treated with connection and compassion rather than control. They have decades and decades and decades of experience in treating addiction, and co-occurring mental health disorders, including severe mental illness, SMI, and they have amenities you wouldn't believe. They have a sound bath meditation. They have the Uber Spiritual Sweat Lodge. They have surfing, equine therapy, and so much more. They offer you the most comfortable detox that you can get, which is critical when you're coming off of anything. We all know that. If you're fucked and you're willing to go to sunny Southern California, I strongly, strongly recommend going to Aloe. This episode of Dopey is also brought to you by our very good friends at CASL, which of course stands for Clean and Sober Love, the dating app for people who choose a sober way of life. It was created by one addict to help another addict to date safely. So here's the deal. You got clean, you got sober, you got a new way of life, and now you're ready to date. So where are you supposed to look? The reptile house at the Bronx Zoo? CASL is the solution. Dating in recovery is real and worth considering if you have your shit together. CASL is the platform where you can meet the most beautiful junkies and the sexiest crackheads around all over the world. Like-minded addicts living clean. Install the app now on the App Store or the Google Play Store. By the way, it's totally fucking free. Also, as people keep signing up for CASL, their their profile platform grows and you have more people, more chances to meet. They also have an amazing chat feature. So if you're home alone during the pandemic, reach out to a beautiful addict on CASL. This episode of Dopey is also brought to you by our great friends at Grady's Cold Brew Coffee, which, of course, is Grady'sColdBrew.com. Grady's is an amazing, independently owned and operated cold brew coffee company founded in 2011 right in New York City in the heart of the Bronx over in Hunts Point. Grady is a real person. When you order the Grady cold brew kit, you're going to receive 36 cups of cold brew, which is three batches of 12 cups each. And before I say anything else, you should know that Grady's makes delicious cold brew coffee. They sweeten it with a little bit of chicory. It is amazing, a great value, and it's amazing just to have cold brew coffee sitting in your fridge. It is great with goat milk, oat milk, whole milk, skim milk, even 2%. Even if you like half and half, Grady's goes good with that. If you use a code that says DOPEY25, you will save 25% off on your Grady's cold brew coffee. So go to Grady'sColdBrew.com and put in Dopey 25 and save 25%. Perfect for Christmas. All right, Dopey Nation, we have a new ad, a new sponsor. Please take note. 
Attention, cigarette smokers. There's a less harmful alternative available to you. According to two studies published by Public Health England and the U.S. National Academies of Sciences and Engineering, they found that vaping poses a small fraction of the risks of smoking, and switching to vapes may have substantial benefits over cigarettes. This is why so many cigarette smokers have made the switch to vaping, and their brand of choice is Twist E-Liquids. Twist is an American-owned company that makes its delicious e-liquids in Los Angeles, California. Twist has won several awards for creating mouth-watering flavors such as its best-selling lemonade, sweet treats, and dessert flavors. But Twist also produces a line of sweet tobacco flavors. Try Twist e-liquids today and get 30, that's right, 30% off your first purchase with the code DOPEY30. That's D-O-P-E-Y 30, and it's sold exclusively on daddysvapor.com. That's Dopey30 on daddysvapor.com. Try Twist today and make the switch. Just in case you didn't understand, it's 30% off by using the Dopey code Dopey30 at daddysvapor.com. If you like to vape, try the Twist. Save 30%. And of course, finally, this episode is brought to you by listeners like you within the Dopey Nation through the power of and the passion of the Dopey Patreon page. And there is so much stuff happening in the Dopey Patreon page. Uh, Next week, of course, is the end of the month Dopey Patreon Zoom to all of our $5 subscribers. All of our $2 subscribers every week enjoy a new uh, episode of the Dopey Patreon show. Last week was Dopey Nation legend Annie Ellie, and she was amazing, I have to say. Also... Next month, we're going to get a new preview of the bonus episode for $10 Patreons, plus they get free stickers. So go to patreon.com, help me out. It really, really, really is great for me to have you guys supporting the show through Patreon. Also, if you want dopey gear for Christmas, you go to dopeypodcast.com. We have really, really nice stuff. I just got the Skull Dopey hoodie, and I've been wearing it constantly. Super comfortable. I highly recommend that. We have mugs there. We have long sleeve T-shirts, fucking tank tops. Buy a nice present for one of your friends. And, of course, all of those are made by our partner out of Cincinnati, Ohio, the great SRO Prince, which is uh, run and operated by a couple of wonderful ex-heroin addicts in recovery as well. If you want beanies, I got beanies. I think new ones are coming in, which is very exciting. I have dopey snapbacks. I have the Oyve snapbacks. Just hit me up on Venmo for any of that stuff. And uh, I worked out this deal with Katz's Delicatessen where I work that they're going to give 10% off all of their food to dopey listeners. So if you want the world's best pastrami or corned beef or any of that stuff, just go to katzesdelicatessen.com, put in the dopey code, save 10%. Anyway, enough with the fucking ads. Here is the show. Hello and welcome to Dopey, the podcast about drugs, addiction, and dumb shit. My name is Dave, and I'm here with my good friend, Ray. Wait, is this real? Yes. Okay. Um, fucking Ray. What? Hiding dopey from the world and yet constantly posting about dopey. What? Constantly posting and constantly hiding dopey. Not to mention his incredibly hardcore love addiction. I don't... You're Strung crazy. out on the international the boys fuck? of Europe. Lay off of me. Like, I think on. I think you should... I think you should... Uh, uh, write a song called International Boys of Europe <laughs> International Lover Yeah, do you want to do that? Oh, oh, I had I a good idea Yes I just remembered it You, you posted a thing El Salvador uh, Bosnia ah. Dopey When pandemic is over Dopey World Tour That's all you want to do Is go on the world tour And, <laughs> yes. and, fuck, and fuck the world <laughs> Um, what was I thinking? Can you believe that? I'm, I'm riding on the train in today, yeah. and I'm looking at my emails, which I'm apt to do on the train, yeah. and I get an email from a man named 
Carlos, yeah. who works for a company I think called Pod Something, and he says he's happy to inform me that Dopey is yeah. the number one alternative health podcast of El Salvador. Yes, that's great. It's got to be. Go. It cannot be real. Let's go. It's meaningless. There is no listen. Oh, I thought you pulled that information off of your. No, some some company gave me that. They said Croatia were number three. <laughs> I thought that was from Apple. Number nine in Brazil. Yes, it's it's from someplace else, and uh, I don't believe a word of it. However. Dopey Nation, if you're an El Salvadorian dope or a Croatian dope or even a Brazilian dope, send in an email to dopeypodcast at gmail.com and let me know that it's true. Yeah, I mean, I know there's listeners in countries where English is not the main language, but it's really just English speaking countries. I don't know. I think it doesn't say something good about us if that's the information we get <laughs> is that we're killing it in the countries that don't speak English. It's like that's not a it's not a great well, statistic. Right back to that guy and ask him more. What I did, you- and then he asked me if I wanted to subscribe to his podcasting oh. information service. Oh. And then I was thinking, well, I did get high from this email, so maybe <laughs> maybe I will pay you for more endorphins, that's Carlos. Like, if do you get this like as a musician, you I constantly get emails, all my friends get of like Hey, we're listening to your music and we really love it and we want to do something with you. I love that. When I used to post on uh, SoundCloud, they would be like, collab? I'd be like, yes, yes <laughs> I will collab. Because it gets you high when you hear that shit. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of really big stuff coming right down the pipe for my endorphins. And I'm going to go yeah. over this really quickly. Okay. Very soon, the Dopey Podcast will reach... Five million downloads. And as usual, I'd like to create a scam sham contest <laughs> to see who can predict when we get to five million downloads. And what's the grand prize? I don't know. Nothing. I don't ever give prizes. I give a t-shirt. Sure. It's like you, you swore to the winner of the dopey Patreon Zoom that they would get a prize. Yet have they gotten a prize, right? Wait. Did I say? You swore? swore that they would get a prize on the Dopey Patreon. Oh, Zoom. right, right. Did, did you say anything to me about it ever? Austin, Austin won. Did you send him anything, Ray? That's your response. You said you were going to make sure, and you didn't make sure. <laughs> Wait, he was going to like call into the show and get a T-shirt. Nothing happened. He doesn't answer his face. Austin, you don't answer your Facebook Messenger. He answers days later. He doesn't get high on this shit you like won. I do. You won. I have. I have a exclusive. Original dopey hoodie made by Champion, out of print. We don't do them anymore. Oh. He's going to get one of those Good. one day. <laughs> now, so who is going to make a guess at the five millionth download? Send in your predictions to dopeypodcast at gmail dot com. More importantly, we are at the precipice of two thousand reviews, which would have been a landmark day. For me and Chris, it'll be a sort of okay day for Ray, although he's very upset that there's no reviews with his name. Now there's reviews with my name in it. Nice. So we need 20 more reviews, I think. There's 20, almost 2,000 reviews? That's what I said. I think wow. there's 1,980 reviews. So I need 20 reviews. Please write them now on iTunes. Make them five stars. Make them sweet. You don't have to mention Ray if you don't want to. It's okay with me either way. Wait, when I read them recently, in my memory, there was like 100 no, there's a lot of reviews. Wow. But we need more and we do it do it for do it for Chris. And if you don't want to do it for Chris, do it for my dad. And if you don't want to do it for my dad, do it for Ray. Because now he's whole do it for me. Do it for Ray. <laughs> and then Wait, also does that mean does that help people find the show if it has five star reviews, it pops up in a higher order? The more five star reviews you get the higher we are rated in places like El Salvador oh, and Croatia. Yes, yes. It is a, an algorithm that is way more complex than my stupid brain can comprehend. And then the other thing, and I'm going to be done with this weird bullshit promotional stuff, is we're right knocking at the door on 10,000 Instagram followers. Really? So if you listen to the show and you don't follow us on I Instagram... I think I follow... Well, Inst- Ray, <laughs> I think it's time to follow us on Instagram. And Dopey Nation, if you listen to the show and you don't follow us on Instagram, follow us on Instagram. Apparently at 10,000 Instagram followers, I can do a swipe up thing. Oh. Do you know what that is? No. Yeah, I mean, I don't really know either. <laughs> but you can swipe it up. sounds good. That's what Amy Dresner wanted to swipe up, and I want to swipe up too. So follow us on Instagram. You know, there's a, there's a lot of good stuff happening on Reddit. All of a sudden, people are saying nice things on Reddit. So check out Reddit. Check out fucking Twitter. The Facebook, of course, we need to be bigger. It's like, and I think that the thing that is going to propel us to the next place 
is um, DopeyCon 2, which I'm killing myself <laughs> for. Do- I just saw a preview of DopeyCon 2, and it's amazing. Reveal nothing. I will reveal nothing, except that it's just like DopeyCon 1. To me, Dave was talking about this DopeyCon, and I thought, this is all in his imagination. None of this is real. And now he's been telling me about DopeyCon 2 for like you know a month, and I was like, I, don't, I think this is all imagined by, by Dave. By a crazy person. Yeah, but now I saw it, and it's cool. It, yeah, I mean, like, listen, it might be, it's going to be on, this is what we know. This is what you guys should know. I'm not going to reveal too much. It will be on video. It looks like the date that the video of DopeyCon 2 is going to come out is the 9th of December. That's what we're looking at. December 9th. It is going to be a Wednesday night. It is going to run from about 8 to 9.30. It is only going to be once, probably on YouTube. You got to watch it. We're going to set up a little chat thing. We're going to have a watch party, a premiere, some some big thing. A red carpet? No, no carpet. So Everyone's- if you're in Australia, you're going to have to watch it at a really weird time. Oh, it's going to fuck up all of our international listeners. Well, it always, like, the Zoom always fucks them up. Right. And then we're going to be, then it's all going to live on Patreon. Whatever. Fucking, today was another important day in the history of the Dopey Nation, sort of. What? Artie Lang's podcast is back on. And instead of letter, instead of Artie's halfway house, it's now called Letters to Artie. And it's Artie answering drug addict letters. Fucking Artie. I know, but we at the Dopey Podcast are always loving and praying for the great Artie Lang. We are? I am, okay. yes. Loving. Like everybody's starting a podcast about drugs now. Like who else? Like several people in the Dopey Nation. Right. I'm starting a podcast about drugs and addiction. It's called Just Ray. <laughs> it's not Just Ray. It's called, no, Pub- it's called, it's called Pubes <laughs> and Urine. It's Dave Free. Okay, um, there's a lot of other stuff to talk about, but I want to jump right into some hardcore Dopey shit. Do you want to hear some hardcore dopey yeah, shit? Yeah, what? We got a voicemail oh God. from a, a hardcore what? Well, you ask me to read these things sometimes, and I always just think it's going to be like, hey, Dave, we took acid and we saw flying saucers, and then it's always like somebody dying. Like the first one, I'm like, oh, this is not funny. This is real. Well, this is a voicemail. You don't have to read anything. I know, but just I'm always expecting them to be funny, and they're not. All right, this is a voicemail from a longtime dopey listener named Drew. And uh, he's from Delaware, and it's uh, a crazy story. Okay, let's hear it. How's it going, Dopey Nation? This is Drew from Delaware. Um, Got a crazy little dopey story for you guys. So not too long ago, I had a relapse, and uh, I ran back to my drug of choice, heroin. And I decided this time I was going to drive up to Kensington, which is about 30 minutes from my home. And go grab a couple bags. So that's what I did. I, in my infinite fucking retarded wisdom, decided to steal some Lego sets from Target. I sold them at a fence for a hundred bucks and took my hundred bucks, dropped 20 in the tank, and drove up to Kensington. Now, my normal move is to go to this same spot in Kensington park my car, walk up the block, holler at one of the dope boys on the block, tell him I need eight or whatever, and then drop off my money and go get my my dope. Well, this time, uh, the dope boys weren't out at the spot, and I had gotten on this hell-bent mission that I was getting my shit. So I drove around looking for anybody that I could spot selling, but I couldn't find anybody. And mind you, I'm not super familiar with the area, but I know Kensington Ave. Uh, so I drove past this guy who didn't look homeless, but may have been. And I pull over and I go, yo dude, you know where to get some dope? And he goes, yeah. I was like, well, I'll hook you up with a couple dollars. You help me out. He's like, that's what I do, dude. I'm like, all right, great. Uh, he asked me, what are you looking for? Fenny dope, Fenny trank. Uh, I don't really fuck with the Fenny trank. I would rather have heroin, but it's all fentanyl out there. Even if they tell you it's heroin, it's fentanyl. Um, so I was like, I'll just get some Fenny. Um, so he puts his four bags in my car, drives me to the spot. I give him the money. I hold on to his stuff cause I ain't getting burned. Take his cell phone, his bags and all that. And he goes, gets my shit, brings it back. I pay him and I'm on my way. 
Well, as I'm driving home, I realize he had left his jacket in the back of my car. And I'm like, oh, shit, I'll never find this guy again to return this jacket. Plus, I don't want the evidence in my car, so I got to get rid of this thing. So I pick it up to toss it at the Wawa. And when I pick it up, I feel it's super heavy. And I'm like, oh, shit, what's in there? So I rush the pockets. And he has his dope kit in there. There's no... uh, no gear in there. It's just like cookers and, and alcohol and, and, uh, cotton filters and all that shit. And I check the other pocket and there's a pill bottle in there and I'm like, Oh shit, score. But when I look at it, it has two blunt roaches in it. And I'm like, uh, mm. and I just kind of take the jacket and all in the kit and everything. I toss that, but I kept those blunt roaches in my car. Cause I kind of forgot I put them in the cup holder. So I get home uh, over the next couple of days, I do my dope and I don't know what came over me, but I was like, I'm going to tear one of his blunts open and I'm going to go smoke some wheat. Well, I go, I get one of the blunts, I split it open and I'm like, this doesn't smell like weed. Uh, it, it just was an unfamiliar smell to me. And mind you, I've done a ton of drugs in my life. Um, so I know that crack smell, that oily cocaine smell, weed smells like, what what acid tabs look like, what DMT crystal looks like. I, I, I'm familiar. So uh, I break it up, I put it in the bowl, and I take a hit. And when I take a hit and breathe out, I'm like, this isn't weed. I don't know what it is, but it isn't weed. So I blow it out, and it makes me feel like I'm, I'm going to get sick to my stomach. I, I spit on the ground a couple times. And I walk inside, and I lay down, and... I don't know what was in it. It could have been anything, but it made it it just made me freak out and all of a sudden I had this realization and this like god shot, this this voice of god speak to me and say, "What are you doing, Drew? You're stealing Lego sets, you're you're hitting a fence, you're driving to Kensington, you're getting dope and now you're smoking the blunt roaches of some homeless guy of God knows what's in there. And now I don't know, have I just smoked spice? Have I smoked fucking PCP? What was in there? Well, it made my heart race and I just freaked out. And this is like 5 a.m. when this goes on. So I just had a breakdown and I had this realization in my head of, I don't need to be doing this. If I just stopped right now, things would be okay. And as a drug user, you have this feeling of once I get my drugs, I'll be okay. Once I get my fix, I'll be okay. Once I got the money, I'll be okay. Once I get back home, I'll be okay. But that's not really you being okay. That's more, I'll be where I want to be. That's not, you will be okay. And just in my head, I hear like God speak to me and say, just stop, Drew. Just stop right now and you'll be okay. And I just collapsed and I didn't know what to do with myself. I just started crying profusely thinking of what I've done. And I ran upstairs to my girlfriend at 5 a.m. and I woke her up and I And I told her, I need to get in bed with you and you got to hold me because I'm freaking out. And I just probably cried for 30 minutes thinking, what is happening to me? What am I doing? And you never think of these thoughts as it goes on. It really is like a self-actualization you got to run into. And I'm hoping I did. And I'm not sure if I did, but I'm hoping I did because... Why am I doing this? I'm just unchecked chaos. And I was like, if I come clean to my girlfriend, if I tell her everything right now, she can save me. But I still haven't done it. And I don't know that I can because I don't I don't want her to leave me. But I also need someone to hold me accountable to me because I am my best worst influence influence i can talk myself into anything i talked myself into theft into lies into some of the worst situations you could put yourself into and i 
seem to only talk myself out of it after I've done it. And I can look back and say, what are you doing, Drew? What are you doing? You did all of this, not because you were in withdrawal, but because you wanted to get high and you couldn't just handle yourself. So after that, I dumped the bowl out. I threw the roaches away. I just got rid of all of it. And I've been clean since. But I'm sure other people have found themselves in that situation. And it's just a crazy thing to allow yourself to have happen to you, especially when you do it to yourself. I hope you're all staying safe out there. Drive safely. Be careful with what you use. Narcan's available for free almost anywhere. And tell people you love them before you can't. See ya. So normally I like to play the voicemail at the end of the show, but I just felt like Drew, when I, when I always talked to Drew, he was in sobriety. And uh, the fact that he's relapsing and the fact that uh, he had this sort of revelation, which came from, I think, smoking K2 or, or something, you know. I was talking with Tina Mathis, who lives in Kensington, and, uh, and she said everybody's on this fentanyl, this uh, the fentanyl trank, the fenny yeah, dope, the yeah. fenny. People think they're on Xanax and they're on fentanyl, and um, and she said everybody else is smoking this K two, and um, but again, I never took fentanyl or smoked K two. Me neither. I don't understand K two. It's like I don't understand that kind of drugs. That they're like make you crazy, like PCP and K two and spice. bath salts. Bath salts. Like how do they sell that shit? And I don't understand Kensington either. Of like. I was just in Philly twice. I'm like, how does a city, which is like normal in most parts, then just have one area where we're like, okay, we're just not going to fuck with that part of town. You can do anything you want. We're not even going to pick up the trash. I mean, in The Wire, it was because they were pushing the drug activity to one part of town to, to make the rest of the city have less drugs. That was the reason they did it in Baltimore during the TV show The Wire. Well, walking around Philly is like, this is the most beautiful city. I love it here, but I know that exists right over there. Right. Well, I think uh, Drew's message is very powerful, and I think um, I hope that uh, he goes with that instinct. And obviously, his girlfriend can't save him. I know that Drew knows what he needs to do, and uh, and anybody that doesn't know what to do, call somebody who's doing it, and, and they can instruct you on how to do it. And I know Drew's done it before, and um, I hope he gets his shit together. Yeah. So in the history of making the show, there's this guy that people have constantly been referring me to, which is this rapper out of Boston called Slain. And Slain is in a rap group with the dudes from House of Pain uh, called La Coca Nostra. He has been in a ton of movies. He was discovered by Ben Affleck. And uh, he knew about Dopey and he was excited to come on. Yeah, I was looking at his IMDb. Like he's been in a ton of movies. He's a, a, a. I called him a movie star. He said, "No, he's a character actor." Yeah, well, that's exactly what he, he's a character actor, and he's a, a working and, actor and a rap star and a person in recovery and a drug addict. Yeah, and uh, here he is, slain. All right, so um, I'm very excited. I have this dude on the on the phone and the Zoom. Very professional. He is an actor and a rapper. I mean, I guess you're a rapper first and an actor second, correct? Well, I'm, I like to think I'm a storyteller, man, and whatever that whatever that looks like, it looks like. You know, I'm a writer, I'm an actor, I'm a rapper. That's a much better introduction. He's a writer, he's a rapper, he's an actor, he's a storyteller, he's a father, he's a husband, he's a man in recovery. It is the man. I'm not a husband. I'm an ex-husband. Oh, he's a fucking. Yeah. He's an ex-husband. Even better. <laughs> he's a man in recovery. His name is Slain, aka George. Welcome. What's up, kid? How you doing? Um, yeah, man. People have been uh, people have been writing to me about you for a long time uh, in the dopey nation. They're like, "Oh, there's this dude slain. There's this dude slain," and I didn't make the connection to you and Danny Boy. And I was like, and then I made the connection, and, and I, I'm in touch with a lot of Danny Boy's friends, and they're like, you're a fucking idiot that you didn't know who Slain was. And then I finally figured it all out, and I've been listening to your music, and I think it's great. 
I'm a big fan. They, right. Yeah, they've been they've been clamoring for it, huh? I uh, I've been getting a lot of messages too on on social media and stuff. You gotta do dopey. You gotta do dopey. So when you reached out, I was like, bet. And I and, and I talked to Danny, and Danny said, "Did Danny do the first episode you guys did?" Danny was the first celebrity we ever had on the show. He didn't do the first. We did like twenty five episodes of just me and my friend Chris, and Danny yeah. came in like random, and he was our first big guest. Yeah, I mean, Danny Boy is like my big brother, man. I mean, he's one of my best friends. I had posters of House of Pain on my wall when I was 14. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, but, you know, he he ultimately became like a great mentor and friend to me, not just in music, but in sobriety. I mean, I was a pain in the ass to him, before, you know, when he was in early recovery. You know, we were on the road touring, so he had, like, two years sober. And, you know, like, when you're two years sober, it's still, like, you know, and I'm fucking drinking two-fifths a day. I'm doing every drug I can find in every city we're in. I'm fucking, you know, it's also, like, my moment where I've arrived. I'm on tour with House of Pain. It was La Coca Nostra, but, you know, like, I'm, I'm fucking running amok everywhere, every place we go. It's my first time doing, like, major touring. And, and and he's just like fucking. I'm, you know, he was annoyed with me for for a decade at least. Like he loved me like a little brother, but I was a pain in the ass. Man. Was it annoying, or was it more temptation, or was it just like what the fuck? I'm trying to keep my shit together, and this dude is is running wild, kind of thing. You'd have, you'd have to ask him. I think I was just on full blast. You know, like I made it. You know what I'm saying? Like I was at my I made it moment. Like like I had arrived, and and nobody was gonna ruin my. Fun fucking party you know what i'm saying like this was what i've been waiting my whole life for to be you know we're going out in front of ten thousand people and and doing a lacoca set and then ending it with jump around and like you know i grew up on that shit man and you know i'm drinking i'm drinking a fifth of a gray goose before stage a fifth of jameson after the stage and every drug that i could find under the sun depending on where we were you know i was sleeping very rarely you know, I would pass out with some Xanax and and I just keep it moving. You know, I'm putting cocaine between my toes when we board planes to go into different countries and, and all that shit. But you know, right? And and you guys might might know Slain from La Coca Nostra or from his solo stuff, or you might know Slain from these movies. Like you're a fucking big movie star. You're in some fucking big movies. The town. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a character actor, man. I'm not a movie star. I'm a character actor. But yeah, I've been I've been a part of some cool ones, man. I was in Gone Baby Gone was the first one I did, and uh, I mean that was insane how it happened because I had just I I signed a pre production deal with DJ Lethal. I think in 2003. So I met Danny Boy at CBGB's. This is kind of a long story if I go through everything. But I met Danny Boy at CBGB's in. I don't want, I don't know. I think it, it was somewhere in the, either in the early 2000s or the late 90s. And he was sober at the time, which really bummed me out because I wanted to have a beer with Danny Boy. Right, right, right. And when he said he was sober, I was like, oh, sober. You know, to me then, it was like, fucking, that was the worst thing you could be. I didn't even understand it. That's funny. And, uh, but he, he ended up plugging me in later on when he came to Boston to record for like, it was really like a demo that I was working on. It was like the first record that fell apart. But uh, I met Danny and he, then he was all strung out and, uh, he, and he was not sober anymore. But, uh, you know, we, we developed like a friendship and a relationship. He plugged me in with DJ Lethal, who signed me to a pre-production deal. I went out and I'm crashing on Danny Boy's couch when he was really kind of at his bottom and you know i was just you know i was partying and having a good time and um he wasn't at that place of using like where he was partying and having a good time he was like super desperation good. right yeah 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 which i would i would reach later but uh yeah man so so you know over the course of years, I'll speed through it. Over the course of years, Lacoca became what it became, and and Il Bill came into the fold, and and Everlast came into the fold, and right as that was all coming together, I had started making making some noise in Boston specifically. Uh, you know, I was really like getting some buzz in, in, in Boston with a mixtape that I did called "The White Man Is the Devil," and um, 
<clears throat> and I started getting some buzz, but I was still like, I was living in a, and I was squatting in a warehouse, man. I no, had no hot water and no electricity. It was supposed to be a recording studio. The dude who was backing me, uh, got, got pinched and he was looking at like 10 years. So he, you know, he, he was out of the picture and then the rent wasn't getting paid there. And I ended up squatting in this warehouse and, at that time is when Makoka started to gain some, you know, that's when, when Everlast came in the fray and Bill came in the fray and we're recording and I'm flying out to LA. But then when I come back to Boston, I'm, I'm squatting in this like abandoned warehouse with the half, with the framing from a studio, uh, you know, half built. And, um, and the Boston Herald did a story about, Lakoka and House of Pain getting back together as Lakoka goes through with the super group and me it, you know it was kind of centered on there's a picture of me and some of my backstory and Ben Affleck was casting for a movie called Gun Baby Gone which was his directorial debut and he saw me in the paper so I'm drinking up the street at the after hours spot till 7 in the morning charging my phone there I walk up to to Mass Ave, which was right near where I was squat squatting, that's like Methanol Mile in Boston, and I buy every Boston Herald on the rack, and I'm looking at my picture in the paper, reading the article, and I pass out drunk, and I wake up at four in the afternoon, and I have all these fucking missed phone calls, and, you know, people saw me in the paper, whatever, but a lot of them were from Ben Affleck's people, and they were trying to track me down to get me to come in and audition for this movie, so... You know, I, I ended up getting a role in Gone Baby Gone. <clears throat> Lakoka Nostra starts to do <clears throat> do its thing. We're touring around. So I, I go from squatting in this warehouse to, you know, touring around the world with my favorite band of all, like uh, my favorite childhood rap group. And I have shoot a movie with Ben Affleck and Morgan Freeman and Ed Harris, like, you know, in a matter of. You know, a month it turned around like that. It's crazy, but you were still active. I have a lot of questions, but we're gonna we're gonna. I don't want to fast forward. I want to start a little bit at the beginning in terms of like, obviously, you know, you and I are both recovering drug addicts. I I like, you know, I lost everything I ever had. I was a terrible heroin addict. Like, I lost my family. I lost everything. Um, but I started, you know, as a as a you know, a late teen getting high, loving weed. Like, how did you start? Like, where did you find your, your start in, in being a drug addict? Where did it start? Well, it's, yeah, it started with fucking with booze and, and weed, man. And, and, and I mean, it was very quick for me though. You know, I, um, I moved around Boston a lot. And it's like, I always kind of like, I looked for, that was the way I connected with people like drinking and getting high. <clears throat> but you know I started doing so right after I started drinking and smoking weed I was very quickly like smoking angel dust doing acid masculine cocaine you know all that stuff it happened like o- over the course of months for me do, me, know, so do like, me a favor hold the phone because it's going to be way better sound yeah over the over the course of months for me you know I went from from drinking and smoking weed uh, to smoking angel dust, acid, masculine. How old were you? How old were you? Like when you first did dust? Fifteen. What was the like? Break it down. Like where were you? What was going on? How did it happen? I was in Charlestown, so I went to a I went to a Catholic high school in Boston called Don Bosco, and, and there, it was all city kids. It was a technical high school. So, you know, it was like most kids didn't go to college after it. It was like woodworking, electric, you know, all that stuff. And um, and it was ki- all kids from different parts of the city. So we would go and party in different parts of the city every weekend. And uh, and the Charlestown kids, which is where the town was shot, they were already like smoking dust and stealing cars and shit. So, <laughs> you know, when I went to Charlestown for the first time, I smoked dust, you know, because there was a kid, there was a kid that I hung with all the time in school, and he would always talk about smoking a bag of dust, you know, and and uh, yeah, I smoked a bag of dust. I chased a mailman down the street, like I forgot what my name was, right. and I was like, this shit is fantastic. <laughs> were you were you already rapping at that point? Had hip hop been your consciousness? I was rapping since I was nine years old, but it wasn't something that I outwardly. You know that I actively did. I wasn't like freestyling to my friends and stuff like that. That just wasn't accepted at that time. It was like, you know, if you're a white dude rapping, you are, you know, you're like fucking a wannabe and shit. So I didn't. I kept it like in my notebooks at that point, and I would record into 
you know, I would plug like I would have I had a two two tape uh, radio and one would record and one would play and I put like find an instrumental single like a maxi single and I would write a rhyme and I would record it into the other one and you know but I did that kind of like on the low right how much did uh like I I I think I'm a little bit older than you, but around the same, we're around the same age, I think. But, uh, and I, I loved hip hop when I was a kid. And, uh, in my, I went to this very nerdy high school. Like, we came from basically the opposite walks of life. Like, I never, I never got into a fight. Uh, I was, for, you know, like, I was around a bunch of nerds. Nobody really fought. And, uh, and if anyone in my neighborhood, like fucked with me I would get very scared You know what I mean I grew up in Chelsea And it was before Chelsea was very gay It was like Chelsea was kind of Very You know I grew up across the street From hardcore projects I, I grew up in the middle class Jewish projects And uh and when people would fuck with me, I would get very scared and I would never be fighting in the streets, but I wouldn't be afraid to freestyle like an idiot with my friends, which is like the <laughs> opposite of you. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it, you know, it was just, it was a weird kind of dynamic, man. It was, and, and hence like my favorite rap group was House of Pain, like the Shamrocks, you know, I, I bought that. See, I never heard their music before I bought the CD. I used to go to Tower Records. I'd smoke a blunt. I'd walk into Tower Records and I'd look at all the music and I picked up that CD. It had just come out, I guess. And cause I hadn't heard jump around yet. And I, I look at the CD and they're drinking beers on the back cover in the bar room and the shamrock was in the front and I bought it and I brought it home and I was like, this is the shit. The, th you know? the thing about that music too, was the beats, those beats were just like, that was just the moment where hip hop exploded musically. You know, people could say anything and the beats were so hypnotic and trippy. And, and well, that was Muggs too. Muggs, amazing. Lethal. And Muggs, I mean, still to this day, one of the greatest producers in hip hop history. Lethal is so, such a phenomenal producer that's vastly underrated too. But you had, you had Pete Rock then and Premier and all those were just great producers. How, like, with your drug use and emceeing, was it connected? Like, did you have a, like, was it part of smoking? Blunts and drinking forties and but dust wasn't really in that world and, and tripping yeah. wasn't. Well, yeah, yeah, and and I'll tell you what, I kind of left those things behind. I was able to stop those on my own power. Uh, angel dust and hallucinogenics, I was able to stop on my own power. They were the two things because they would they just put me so out of my mind, I couldn't function on them. So I stopped those. Like as I, I, I think like. After high school, I took a year to, like, I sobered up, meaning, like, I just drank on the weekends. I, I went to AA for the first time, like, when I was 18 years old and shit, and I cleaned up my act. And then I went to school in in New York. And uh, Where'd you go? You know, I went to the School of Visual Arts just for seven months. But, but that brought me to New York, which was the first time that I started, you know, I had all these rhymes I had been writing for fucking nine years by the time I got there, and I had never let anybody hear them. And um, so I get to New York, and, and I start, and then I'm like ciphering and stuff like that, and, and rhyming, and people were blown away by what I have, and I start to realize I'm pretty good at this, actually, you know? And, and then I started going to open mics, and, and uh, I went to... Uh, the New Eureka Poets Cafe with sure. Barbito had an open mic, and that was the first time I ever got on stage and rapped when I was 18 or 19. Why did you go to an AA meeting at that point? I mean, the first time I went to an AA meeting, well, you know, my, my, a guidance counselor in school brought me in when I was 16, and she told me, she's like, you got you got uh, the seventh highest score in the class on the SAT. You're very smart guy you know like you're a smart kid and you and uh, i go what did i get and she goes 1050 i go that's the seventh highest score. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and uh anyways but she's like that's not why i'm calling you in i want you to take this questionnaire i want you to take this test with me and because I'm, I'm worried about your drinking and i was like my you worried about my drinking like this all came to i, didn't, I had no idea anybody knew how it. did she know <laughs> I, I well, I mean, I was I was tripping and going to school, smoking dust outside of school. I was fucked up, man. So right. I mean, you know, the first time, I, well, sec, I, I was doing cocaine in school too, and like, 
and all that. So yeah, so I I took this quiz with her to appease her, and and she uh, you know she showed me the chart, and she's like, "You're 16 years old. You're here on the chart. You're an alcoholic," and um, you know that was brought to my attention. But I but I didn't I didn't. Uh, so when I was 18, I went to an AA meeting for the first time, and it was it's kind. Of, I tell this story sometimes because I it's. I, I, I I was out one night and I was so fucking wrecked and I was on Huntington Ave in Mission Hill and um and I had a shit man. I had a shit really fucking bad and there was nowhere to shit and I I wasn't of age to walk into a bar or anything and um so I'm about to shit my pants and this is a very busy street and it's like two in the morning, people are out and all that and I, and I was like, I'm gonna shit my fucking pants. So I ducked between two cars, two parked cars on you know a major, major fucking, major avenue in Boston, you know. And and I fucking shit between two cars. And this this couple comes walking by, and I turn around, and there's a shit hanging out of my ass. <laughs> and they both go, oh, you know. And it was, I it was just, it was just overwhelming shame. Yes. I just felt so much shame, and I called my uncle the next morning, and I was like, uh, I heard that, I heard that you're an alcoholic, and he's like, <laughs> he goes, who the fuck told you that? <laughs> uh, I wanted, I, I wanted to know if you could take me to a meeting, and he's like. Who the fuck told you that? You know, he got like offended, it was, which in retrospect is really funny. But he took me to, to my first meeting. Who did tell like, you though? Who told you your uncle was an alcoholic? Your mom or something? I, yeah, I think my mom told me. So he was like pissed about that. You know, she but, blew uh, up his, his spot. She blew up his anonymity. Blew up his spot. Like, it, 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 and he told me like, uh, you know, the most important A is the second one. Anonymous. This is anonymous. You don't fucking say who you see here. You don't fucking say that I brought you here. You know, all that. Like, real old school, like, save your fucking, hold on to your seat and shoot for midnight shit. And I love him. He's, uh, you know, he, 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 you know, he had to watch me go on another 18 years after that. When I got into that meeting and I realized what it was, and that's what people tell the story, I was like, there's no way I'm telling this shit story for the rest of my life. I better go out and, and keep fucking drinking again. <laughs> <laughs> the shit story is great. Did you, did you tell your uncle the shit story? You were like, I don't think I did, man. I think I was too embarrassed to tell my uncle that story. Oh, man. So, so you, you've been to AA. You're in New York, you're ciphering, you do New York and Babito. I mean, like, it's a whole, it's a, a really exciting time. You know what I mean? Uh, for me to hear you talk about, it, it's very exciting for me because that's like when I was into hip hop and, and I was, you know, around there and I, I loved all that shit. Um, so what happened? Like, uh, But it's so weird, though, dude, because I'm like, you know, I've never been exposed. I'm at an art school in New York. So, like, I cleaned up my act. For a year, like meaning, I stopped with the angel dust and the hallucinogenics and all that shit, you know. And I would, and I was tempering my drinking the best I could. And I was exercising. And I lost some weight, and I got ready. And I'm gonna go to college. I'm gonna go to film school. And um, I get to SVA, and to me, it was like another world, man. I mean, I love New York City. It was uh, always amazing to me, and it was, it was like I was high just being there. But I'm around all these really artsy, like intellectual, intellectually artsy kids, and I just didn't know how to handle that neither. So, you know, I found I found a friend who I'm still friends with to this day, um, and he rapped, and he was from Queens originally, grew up on Long Island, and we started rapping, and go, and he brought me to the open mic, and then I met this other kid, Damien, who was, you know, he was all whacked out. I'm friends with him to this day. He's my brother, and. Uh, you know, but fucking then I was off and running with the drinking and the drugs. Once I got to New York, it was like, wow, like everything is just open. You can drink it. I could buy 40s at the store without an ID. You know what I'm saying? And, yeah. and I was kind of off and, and I found ecstasy then. And that was like, I, you know, looking back at it, man, like it's probably the only drug that I still miss. It was it, ecstasy is the best once in a while drug. It's like, but that shit is debilitating. You know what I mean? No, but I did it every day. So I was selling them. I was I was buying them by the thousand packs, and I was selling them, going back and forth to Boston with them. And um, so, but I would always scrape like a hundred off the top for myself. And uh, and you know I wouldn't do a hundred a week, but 
I would give them out to people. I would take I would take ten or eleven in the night and go to the tunnel. You know what I'm saying? Like come out like at fucking sunlight. Look at my watch. I can't even read my watch. My vision is so blurry from the ecstasy and and uh, yeah, I loved ecstasy, man. I loved it. I loved that dopey ecstasy. You know what I mean? I love that down and out ecstasy. But I, I, I didn't see ecstasy was a drug. I didn't do and I almost didn't do enough of it. I went to art school in New York. Also, I went to purchase, and uh, I was happy there because I could do drugs and disappear and be a weirdo and not have anybody ask me what my business was. You know what I mean? <laughs> I like that. Um, when you were at SVA, you wanted to be a filmmaker. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a screenwriter. So okay. that's what I was doing. Now, I took an acting class there uh, because it was mandatory. It was really cool. That was why I went there, too, because I was like, wow, I don't have to, like, take math and science, and which I had failed geometry twice in high school. You know what I'm saying? So it was like... I, like the classes were were screenwriting and video production and film editing and you know what I'm saying. So I really liked it, man. I, I really liked that stuff. And um, you know, I did take an acting class, and you know, the teacher was this Broadway actress. I don't remember her name, but she was like very fiery and she was very critical of everybody and she shit on everybody. And I did a, I picked a monologue that wasn't in a movie. It was in the Westies book. It was Mickey Featherstone on the stand. And that was the first time I'd ever acted in this class. And I did the monologue where he's talking about the serrated edge knives and he's ratting out the coon and Jimmy Coonan and, and, uh, and after she just berated every person in the class, she was like, see, now that's acting. Nice. That's awesome. And, uh, but I never got to explore it because I get kicked out of school about a month later. Why got, Why'd they kick you out? Were you just selling ecstasy? No, no, it wasn't that. It was, <laughs> it was, that actually came a little later than after SBA. But, uh, but, but they kicked me out because... And they didn't technically kick me out. They let me finish from home. But what happened was me and my friend from Queens there that I was telling you about, he uh, he had like this ongoing thing with the doorman in the building. And uh, anyways, we're drinking, we're drunk, we're going out to get more beer at the store about midnight. And, uh, and the guy's there walking a baby pit bull. And we didn't know it was his. It's on a long leash and the pit bull comes up. My friend's petting the pit bull. He's like, get your fucking hands off of my dog. And uh, so we, I'm like, come on, let's go. Let's go to, keep going to the store. So we walk up the street. I think it was 22nd Street. And the guy comes charging up. And he fucking suck as my friend. So we both beat the bag out of him. We beat the shit out of him. And, you know, broke his jar and his ribs and everything. And uh, so the next day, you know, they were like the janitor staff at the building. They clipped the pipes and, our, you know, they like ransacked our rooms and everything like that. And fucking then he called the cops. We were walking outside to the store. He called the cops. He comes up on crutches with his head wrapped. He's like, it's them. It's that, you know. And the, and the cops were like, uh, you know, we told the story. It's like, it sounds like you started it. If you want me to arrest them, then I got to arrest. The cops in New York are cool, by the way. I never heard cops talk like street kids until I got to New York. <laughs> right. And so, yeah, and they, but, and they let us go. But when I got back to the building, you know, there was a big fucking thing and, and they, they recommended that I, that I pass in my last short film from home and finish the last month of school from home. So that was my, that was my college experience. <laughs> and did it go, did it go straight from there to like crazy drugs? Cause it sounds like the next stop was selling thousands of pills of ecstasy and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That was next. That, I mean, I ran hard for a long time and, and, and then, you know, like I, so that was all prior to moving back to Boston and, and squatting in that warehouse where I moved back to Boston, like, you know, the, the rap shit didn't work out, you know, like fucking, and I moved back to Boston. But did you try it? Like, how did the rap thing not work out? Like how much did yeah, you Yeah, I mean, try? I had, I had MC, MC Shan manage me okay. uh, in New York. So I was like going to, I was going to a studio on Farmers Boulevard in Queens and I was recording and, and I was doing these open mics and these shows and, and I, and I was meeting with record labels with my demo and. You know, and it just didn't pan out, man. I had a falling out with Shan. Uh, supposedly, I had like a, a record deal in the works from an offer from RCA or something at the time, but he wanted me to sign this thing where he owns my career, like 50% of my career going forward. And, anyways, I'm not, I spoke to Shan recently. We're all good. It's just part of the game, anyways. But 
Um, but yeah, we we it didn't happen. And I moved back to Boston, and I thought that was it, and I was gonna you know do construction or something, and uh, and then I started up with the music when I got home because what I did realize when I was in New York is what made me different as an MC, and. Um, I had a unique perspective and a different way that I talked and a different accent. And, you know, I started to really explore that and find my voice like that. So when I got back to Boston, I started getting a lot of support locally because, you know, it was it was just it just kind of took on a life of its own. I was kind of there was a drug epidemic in Boston at the time, and I was writing from the center of it, not really realizing that, you know, what was uh, what were you using at that point? I mean, my, yeah, my sip your coffee. Sip your coffee. I don't want to deprive you of a nice sip of your <laughs> culotta or whatever. What are you drinking? Iced coffee. This is my drug of choice now. I have about seven fucking iced coffees a day. Okay. What do you put um, in that thing? The venti from Starbucks. What do you got in your iced coffee? I I just have just a, a latte right now. But generally, I drink uh, the dark roast black. This is pandemic. I drink dark roast black with one brown sugar. I stir around in it. But once in a while, I treat myself to the latte. All right, the wicked dark roast. That's a Boston thing, right? I like the dark roast. I get the stop since the pandemic. I get the jug, so I got about fucking seven gallons at a time in my in my refrigerator. I live for the Boston accent. The wicked dark roast from Charlestown, all that shit. Because Boston, dude, mine is mine's not as bad anymore, man. Because you know I've been fucking traveling around the world. I lived in in LA, you know, by coastally for like ten years, and I've taken dialect coaching for the last four years. Right, that so fucks you up. It kills your purity. Yeah, um, I'm impure. But you know, when I listen to the music, I mean, you're an amazing MC. The accent is part of it. It's it's like. Uh, I mean, I don't know why it reminded me of Biggie Smalls from Brooklyn, but from Boston, like there's a, there's, <laughs> well, there's a, a flow, you know, a real natural thing. You know what I mean? That, I mean, I think you have a really nice flow and, and the Thank accent, you. the accent plays a part in it. When you're talking about being from the inside of the drug epidemic in Boston with your voice, what exactly are you talking about? Well, I just think at that time, and I don't think it's gotten any better. In fact, I know it hasn't, but there was like this blossoming. I mean, there was just a massive drug culture when I was growing up. And, um, you know, I never graduated to the heroin, man. Like, I I ate an OC-40 for the first time. I chewed it up because my best friend was doing them. And um, I, he told me to chew it up. Don't be a pussy. Chew it up. So I chewed up the fucking OC40, and within ten minutes, I was my head was fucking. Oh, I was just out halfway out, and then I was fucking throwing up for like nineteen fucking hours. I popped every blood vessel in my face. I like the fast shit. Like I like. I really am. I'm like a true alcoholic. I love to drink. I love fucking alcohol. I love whiskey. I love vodka. Um, beer isn't quick enough for me. I, I probably didn't drink beer unless there was nothing else to drink. When, in which case, I'd drink every beer you have. But, but like I, my choice is to drink hard liquor that does the, you know, whiskey, vodka that does the trick. I like the warmth that comes comes over me. I like to drink for days at a time. I don't want to stop drinking. Hence the cocaine, because the cocaine allows me to continue to drink. And not to sleep and to continue to drink and not to sleep. And that's what I like. That's really, at the end of the day, like all the drugs I did and everything, like really what it is, is I fucking love to drink. Right. I love to drink and anything that facilitates that, I'm in. And the Coke facilitated it. And uh, yeah. and, and when you start putting, you know, because you were doing mixtapes, like that was the beginning, right, of your of your rise in hip hop where you yeah. you were just drinking like a fish and and doing a ton of coke were you also selling drugs at the same time then uh intermittently i mean monkeys can't sell bananas man i wasn't a great fucking i wasn't a great drug dealer because i was always doing my own shit but i also with the ecstasy dude like you know i told you so when with that like i was on a I was uh, ecstasy replaced cocaine for me for a while i didn't do it once in a while i did it like fucking on a regular basis, five days a week or whatever. And I like, I'm still worried to this day that I'm going to have like Alzheimer's. I forget shit all the time. I, I forget mean, I shit did, all the time too. Did they ever, did you ever get, did you ever get the MRI where they show you the picture of your brain since then? 
No, no. Yeah, don't. Should I? I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I, uh, I did. I didn't do ecstasy like you did ecstasy, but I, I would have seizures from benzos, you know. And uh, and I saw a lot of oh. weird documentaries about uh, the ecstasy putting holes in your brain. And uh, so one time I had this really really bad seizure. Um, I had many, many seizures, like in a lot of crazy places. But one time I had a seizure and I woke up in St. Vincent's and they were like, we got to scan your brain and see what's going on. And they said, well, we don't see holes in your brain, but we see your brain has shrunk considerably. And my dad, <laughs> my dad somehow heard them say there were holes in my brain. And he still tells me that I have holes in my brain. Um, so don't do So let's talk about this because Benzo is actually a big part of my story too. Uh, you know, the Xanax cause ultimately like fucking, I, you know, I would wake up after, you know, a three or four day run with no sleep and, you know, and I would wake up and realize like, holy shit, it's about to happen. You know, like where my throat is fucking closed, like a pinhole. I can't breathe. My fucking, my hands are numb, you know, like, and the Xanax, I thought I found a miracle drug because it really helped me in the beginning, you know. And it also, like, helped me get to sleep when I was too high or when I, you know, like, when my body was just giving up. And um, and it also, like, would help my anxiety and every day. And so I started doing them like that. I got to tell you, that was the hardest shit to get off of out of everything. It was the hardest thing to get off of. Why, why do you say that? Because... I would, because the seizure things, no, I never had a seizure, but I felt like I would get, like, the withdrawals if I ran out of those fucking things was so bad. And when I finally did get off of them, it was like a six-month withdrawal. Yeah. I don't think I slept for a month. Yeah. They put me on Depakote, which was anti-seizure med. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it was just brutal. It was brutal, dude. Like, I got divorced during that. Oh, my God. I mean, God. like, I couldn't put... My brain was like a skipping CD. Like, it just... I couldn't put my thoughts together properly. I... But, I can totally relate. You know, like, like uh, I... I I came up loving weed, love, you know, like weed. I was married to weed. I was like, it was my identity, whatever. When I got into, uh, when I first started doing heroin, I was like, I was like, this is the greatest thing in the world. It makes me feel exactly the way I want to feel. And I met this old guy and, uh, he had every benzo in the world. And he like came to my house and like, he like saw some, I had some old cameras and he's like, you, you like those cameras? And I was like, no, you want to give me pills for them? <laughs> and he, I traded him like three old cameras for like fucking like a hundred pills or 200 pills. And like, I found that benzos, heroin and weed made me feel the way I wanted to feel, but I'm such a neurotic Jew. The benzos were like, oh, it was like perfection. And I just wanted to eat benzos. And um, I would eat so many benzos and I would have, I had seizures all over the country, like back and forth across the country. And, um, and when I finally got off of the benzos, um, I still think about them in this weird sort of way that it's paradise for me. Like, like it's weird. Like, oh, that, dude, when I would chew them up, just the taste of them, like, yeah. especially like if I, if I was withdrawing, like if I ran out of them or, or whatever, like at one time I left the fuck, I left my, my bottle of fucking Xanax in a hotel room in Germany and we flew to Greece and I started, I fucking freaked out, man. Cause I knew like the withdrawal was coming. Right. And fucking, um, so I'm like two or three days without one. And I got the fucking, uh, the concierge knew a doctor. He was from New York and he knew a doctor that wrote me a script, dude. I was fucking free because if I can't get them, like I couldn't even finish the tour. I would have had to fly back. I flew back a day early from my honeymoon cause I ran out of them and I'm, and, and the, my car was parked in New York and I got to drive back to Boston and I'm flying up from Dominican Republic. I'm hallucinating and shit on the fucking drive home. It was awful. It's, it was awful because people don't really like they don't talk about it. They say you can die from kicking benzos, but they don't talk about how uncomfortable it is. I'm interested though. Like we're talking about a pretty amazing thing that happened to you. You're you're a, a drug addict. You're an alcoholic. You're in Boston in the middle of the drug epidemic, and, and explain how you know the phenomenon of slain even happened. Like, like what happened that uh, you blew up and you got Danny Boy's attention and the Coca Nostra and, and you're touring the world and all that shit? Like, what happened? 
I don't know, man. I think it was, you know, like I, you know, I'm a big higher power guy now. So it's like I believe the universe kind of put all that stuff. Like, what made Ben Affleck see me in the newspaper that day? I'm like, very fucking... curious about that too. Like, what the fuck? He sees you in the paper, right? Did he listen yeah. to Coca Nostra? Did he listen to no. Slime? He no. was like, "This is the guy I need in Gone Baby Gone," just from your face. I don't know, man. Did I don't you know. Ask I him? think. I he, I think what happened was so the role he brought me in to read for was Bubba Rogowski. So they had a bunch of white rappers read for that role. So I came in to read. I told you I got the. They called me at four in the. You know, they called me and said, "Can you come in today and audition?" You know, after I woke up at four in the afternoon with all the newspapers that day, and um, and I said no. I'll come in tomorrow because <laughs> I was like, you know, I was, I was yeah. So. Well, I was not fucked up. I was like fucking just picking myself back That's up. That's what I mean. I got fucked up. I got fucked up before I went in for the audition. I had ten beers and ten shots at this bar with a with with a, with a, with a friend of mine, and then he drove me in to get loose. Yeah, to get loose. So he drove me in, and I went in, and I heard the story back. Uh, Later, because now I know the casting people and all that, because I've done. They've cast me in a few movies, and I'm friends with all of them now. And uh, and a friend of mine who worked in the casting office says, like, "Oh yeah, like after you left, she said to Ben, like, I got to tell you, he smelled like booze." And Ben was like, "I don't give a fuck. I love him. Bring him back in." <laughs> ben liked that. I'm sure he loved that you smelled the booze. That you're authentic. You were loose. You were ready to go. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he was. He had a vision. You know. And you were in the vision. Dude, Ben is a man, dude. He changed my life. And I, but I also really admire that about him. Is like, and I think he did it better than anybody, man. He really authentically cast Boston. Like he do, he did those movies so well. And I don't want to just say he does Boston movies well. As great as Gone Baby Gone in the town where when he went and did Argo after that, which is not a Boston movie out, I mean, one best picture. Guy is a fucking, he's got balls, dude. He's got balls. A lot, you know, I want to say that because people don't say that or have like a certain perception of Ben Affleck. Ben Affleck is a master storyteller. He's a brilliant director. He's got balls. And he's a good dude. He's a great guy. So, well, good. You should tell. And, and one day, Ben Affleck will come on Dopey, and I'll say that I'll give him the the Slain endorsement. I'll be like, Slain said you're a good dude with balls, so you got to come on the show. Um, now, was it before or after that that you're touring the world with Coca Nostra? It all happened at once. So, like, that's bananas in itself. And and how bad was the drugs then? How bad was the coke? Or was it just crazy alcohol? I mean, dude, I was at my when I look back at it. You know, I was going to meetings and stuff through that. Like, um, you know, my friends were all fucking dying and going to jail, and, and um, you know, and I fucking you know my high school sweetheart who I who I loved. She had kicked me out like two years prior, and, and, and um, I mean, my life was completely fucking unmanageable at that point, and I needed to get sober then. And then all this shit happens where you know, like my dream comes true, and you know, like I had abandoned the movie idea, like when I got kicked out of SVA and just was chasing the rap thing. So that just miraculously came back in the picture, and um, so then. You know, I'm touring the world with House of Pain. I'm on this fucking movie set doing a movie with Ed Harris and Casey Affleck and Morgan Freeman. It was just, it was, it was surreal. So I, I, that I was like, I figured this out. It's working. I know, I'm, I know, I'm an alcoholic and an addict, but I figured out a way to do it. This is completely acceptable for me to show up drunk and high at a show. It's expected. You know what I'm saying? Like this is it worked. Part of, it, it worked. When did it stop working? Or when did it? When did you even get the seed in your head? Like fuck. You know, like when did it? When did it start not working? Well, there was several. <clears throat> there was several times. I mean, I was. Tr I tried to get sober a thousand times, man. Why? You know, it, because because you know the the high school sweetheart did come back, and we got married, and we had my son. And that's when it started to be something that I could no longer compartmentalize. And that was like where it got really hard because it's very difficult to be like a good husband and a good dad 
when you're drinking two fifths a day and doing blow every day and doing ecstasy and fucking have a, have a benzo addiction, <laughs> you know, it's re- it's re- and when you disappear for three or four days, it's just really difficult to maintain that, you know, and you come home covered in blood with a story and you know what I mean? It's, it's impossible. Not- it's not possible to maintain all those things at once. It is impossible. Yeah. Um, so like, you're trying to get clean. You kind of, what? What was the thing? What was the impetus to, to actually do it? Like, if you, what was the, the the hardest you tried where it didn't click? Like in that period. Oh man! Or was it just ongoing? It was just ongoing, dude. Because you know, because my son's mother, God bless her. I mean, she she's one of my best friends to this day. And um, you know, I can't even imagine what she had to deal with. Now that I'm sober for for almost seven years, and I can look back at it, it's like oh, God bless her. I can't believe like what she stuck it through. And you know, she knew me since I was a kid, and and um, and she is not an alcoholic or an addict. She barely you know drinks. She doesn't. T- I mean, she probably she's one of those people who might have a glass of wine like every two years or something like that. Like it's that infrequently. So picture her dealing with my psychotic shit it just you know um i don't know i it, you know what, what i didn't get sober when i kicked the benzos that was like i was trying to save my marriage and i went into i went into detox at this place that's not there anymore i don't think it's at the faulkner hospital seven south at the faulkner and i don't think they have that as a detox anymore but that was my last detox visit and uh, i did get off the benzos there but then i got you know I got divorced shortly after that. I didn't get sober until 2014. So, I mean, it took me 15 years trying to get 30 days. And right. uh, and, the, and the longest I ever had before this was 77 days when I was shooting The Town. The Town is an amazing movie, too. Like, I love that movie. I love all the Boston movies. Like, I like, uh, like, because there's a, a mysticism to Boston. You know what I mean? There's an old-timey thing to Boston. I... I Love all those movies. The Town is an amazing movie. You're amazing in that movie. I watched your reel today. So I've seen I've seen you in a bunch of different there's somebody I don't know if you posted it, but there's somebody who posted Slane's acting reel. Yeah, that wasn't me. Somebody else <laughs> I didn't think so. My my that's not my official reel, but I did I think somebody sent that to me. I saw it. It's fun. Um but what was it that like when did it click and how did it click? Well, I mean, you know, it clicked, I think, when, I mean, it was such a series of events. I was trying really hard for the year before I got sober. I was, you know, I was tagging along with Danny to meetings and stuff. And like I said, I would get 17 days or 23 days and then I would drink. We had 29 days and drink. You know, I took my 30-day chip to fucking uh, the Roosevelt Hotel and traded it in for a drink. You know what I mean? Like, it just, I was that guy. You know, I couldn't, nobody thought I could get sober, man, including myself. And I didn't think it was going to work this time. It was just, you know, I couldn't, I had this moment, and I talk about it on uh, the day before I die on my last album, where it was just like, you know, I realized like I was affecting my son and he was five years old and, 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 uh, you know, I was, I was leaving him on the steps waiting for me. I wasn't gonna, you know, like I couldn't do, I couldn't handle that. Like everything, there's a million things really like crazy things that should have got me sober up until then. But that was one thing I just could not digest. I couldn't be a, a shitty dad to my son, man. So, you know, this time, this time, like, you know, I had been going to the program for 18 fucking years and I, it didn't work for me. And I didn't think it was going to work this time. But this time I started to do the shit that they say to do, you know, and started like doing the work because it takes work. And um, and I did it because, I, you know, what gave me the willingness this time was that I love my son, man. And I, and I wanted to be a good dad to him. And if it meant that I had to leave like the music and the acting and everything put to surrender that and put it down. Like that's what I did in the beginning. And, um, and, and, and that was kind of the beginning of me getting sober. Right. That's, I mean, that's amazing. I I think, uh, I have, I can relate to that a lot because, uh, I got sober when my daughter was, you know, four and a half, five, exactly kind of the same thing. And, uh, and everyone was like, to me, they said, you have to get sober for her. You have to get sober for her. 
and and I was kind of just in and out. You know what I mean? I think I was still smoking pot and whatever. But what hit me was I, I couldn't live with the fact that I was a bad father. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I just couldn't fucking live with that reality that I was going to be this dad who, I mean, I had a really good dad. I still have a really good dad. I, I couldn't live with the idea of, of being this not good dad. And I don't think I got clean for her. I think I got clean because I couldn't deal with it. You know what I mean? Um, do you think, like, was it, do you understand the distinction? Like, is it different for you or, or was it just strictly for him? No, it's the same. It's the same thing, man. I want to, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't swap. I could, it was a lot. I just couldn't accept that. I couldn't accept that for myself. I love my son so much that I couldn't accept not being a good dad in his life, he, you know, and, and, you know, people say you have to get sober for yourself. And I disagree with that because I tried to get sober for myself for fucking two decades and I couldn't. And when I, you know, you might not be able to stay sober just based on the love of your child. There's work to do, but the, but loving my son gave me the willingness to do the work for the first time. Cause I went to, I, I, I was trying to get sober for 18 fucking years, but I just, I wasn't interested in doing the work. And I, I saw like, you know, the steps and everything. I was like, not for me. Fuck that. You know what I'm saying? Like, what do you mean? A higher power, God, blah, leave that shit. You know what I mean? I just didn't want to do it. And, but my son gave me the willingness. Cause I was like, clearly, like I was just, broken dude like i had pissed through everything i was fucked i was fucked and you know i just couldn't live with the, that fact you know i was in the hospital over and over i was in the emer- i was living in the emergency room the last year i was out there and which is why i always kept going back to meetings and stuff because i had nowhere else to go like i, I it's and it sucked because i was like in the spot where i was like why does this work for all these people, but it doesn't for me? So what, what hit you when you had that thought? I had the same thought. Uh, the thing that hit me was I finally, first of all, I never went to, to AA. I always, I always went to other fellowships. But the thing that hit me, and it hit me like a fucking ton of bricks, was the rarely have we seen someone not succeed who has thoroughly, <laughs> thoroughly followed our path. And I was like, fuck, because I never had thoroughly done it at all. And I was like, and I was always failing. And I wanted to be rarely failing. You know what I mean? Like, I love the idea. It's like, I, I mean, part of me is like, am I going to be the one fuck up who can't get this shit? Or... I've never thoroughly done it. So like for me, it was that question of being thorough was what was, how did it work for you? Yeah, it was that, I mean, it was doing the work, dude. I thought like people just, I thought it was just, man, I just have to show up and like drink coffee and hang out for a sandwich afterwards. And that doesn't work. It doesn't work. This is an illness, dude. You know what I'm saying? There's an illness and it's, you know, it's the, the the physical allergy, which means I put one, in my body and it becomes of primary importance to have another and everything else goes away because I have to get that next drink or drug, right? So that's the physical allergy, the phenomenon of craving. I put it in my body. I have that. But that so that means I can't put it in my body. Now, if you're not a fucking alcoholic or an addict, it's easy. It's like fucking if you're allergic to peanut butter and you have a fucking outbreak, you can't breathe. When you have to go to the hospital. Yeah, like you don't, you don't, you don't walk by peanut butter and jelly sandwiches salivating. Right. You know what I'm saying? You're not looking at fucking peanut butter Twix going, fuck, I really want one. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. like, it's just not, you know, so, and then it's like a mental obsession and the spiritual malady. So I got to address all that shit on a fucking regular basis, man. And that's the work of it. That's the work of it. And all in sobriety, like all these things come up and it's like, I have to like systematically put these things to use in order to fucking stay sober. People are like, how do you stay sober? How do you do it? You know what I'm saying? But trust me, I don't have any magic trick, dude. I'm just doing like what 25 million other people have done, like the way that they do it a day at a time. It sounds cliche. And it's like, when you don't want to hear it, you don't want to hear it. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? But when you get beat down enough, and you lose, and the next you lost, you lose everything. But the next thing you're gonna lose is the one thing that you cannot fathom losing. You know, I was already having supervised visits with my son, and you know what I'm saying. I just couldn't, and I didn't even know, dude, because it was just like I was, you know, I would drink until fucking seven, eight in the morning. I would drink and getting high, and I. 
crash. And by the time I pull myself together, it's afternoon to go visit him. And then I'm back out. I didn't even realize, you know what I mean? I was the last one to see so many things, but I think like you just get to a point where you just beat dude. Like I, you know, like, like I didn't quit. I didn't quit drinking and getting high. I was just finished. Right. You know, I just finished. Um, I, I read someplace or heard you talk about it that, uh, you know, the duality of being this rapper, you know, talking about wildlife and, 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 and underground life, debaucherous life, and then all of a sudden you're clean. It's like, is it, how was that, like, to put the two together, being clean, being, like, in a, tw- in a, in a fellowship, and then also being slain from La Coca Nostra? Like, how do they go together? Yeah, you know what? I think that was like a, a thing in my head early on. Like, how am I going to make the transition? Like, am I still going to be able to do this? And then, like, as I started to have, I, I had really bad writer's block for a few years, man. And, like, I had to change my whole studio schedule. Couldn't come in at night anymore. I had to do it. And then it was like I was filled with all this fear. This isn't good enough. This is horrible. All this. But I think as I started to really, like, work on balance in my life man and you know I, I adopted these new attitudes and the things that helped me stay sober the things that helped me become even better at writing once I broke through it because just accepting what I'm supposed to write today instead of I have to make three songs tonight and I think about what I say and I mean it and authenticity is the most important thing anyway so I don't give a fuck what anyone thinks I'm supposed to be or fucking you know what I I mean, it's all part of, like, what we have to do to stay sober anyways. What the fuck do I care what anybody thinks about, like, how I am now as compared to how I am then or fucking... If anything, bro, I just, this music is a, is a spiritual practice for me. It's, it's focusing on my craft, being present in the moment, you know, uh, writing about something, how I feel it. And just letting it, this is, this shit flows through me. Like, I don't, I realize, like, I don't write anything. It happens to me. Right. You know, this shit comes through me. So I just got to be a, you know, kind of an open vessel for shit to come through me. This is what I do. And I think right now, like, I think my stuff is better than it's ever been. I think it's better than it's ever been. And there's also a part of it where you know nobody wants to be like the old guy in the club drinking and stuff like that it's like if you don't grow you know we're in this new age of hip-hop where it's like now we have like elder statesmen in hip-hop who are 50 55 years old right so it's like you know there's still people doing it at a high level you look at like jay and eminem they're like 50 fucking years old and they're fucking doing it at the highest level possible so i mean there's something to be said about doing age appropriate shit too. Like I, now I look at it like I would be embarrassed to be rapping about the same shit I was rapping about when I was 30. You probably yeah. couldn't, you know what I mean? You would not, people wouldn't want to hear it. You know what I mean? Exactly. It, it just wouldn't work. Um, man, I, I really appreciate everything you're talking about. And, uh, it's fun talking to you. I'm happy. It's it, they were right. It was good that you came on the show. They were, <laughs> they were right to hook this thing yeah. up. Um, you work around treatment now. You work with addicts, like as a as a side gig, or what, is it a side gig? What do you call it? Kind of. I mean, here's how it happened. Like I started going out um, and speaking at a place that my friend Matt Gannon was running. And I was speaking to his groups, and I was he was helping me with charity events. And um, <clears throat> I went through, like, a really painful time, uh, like, a, year, a little, about a year ago. And by so how I stayed sober through it was, like, I just got super active in service, man. And it wasn't enough to just do, like, the stuff in the program. Like, I had to get out. So I started going, like, down Mass Ave with jackets and sandwiches and going into the tent where people are getting high and giving food and talking to people about recovery if they wanted to or not you know what i'm saying but and and i and i turned like my you know pretty much any event that i could into like something for service because i just was in a lot of pain and i needed to get out of self and uh anyways i started going out to that treatment center and then he was like hey why don't you come on and you know join the team and and uh i was like cool you know and i started doing some work and then when the pandemic came and i couldn't tour this year 
you know, I started going out there more and, you know, working with people one-on-one and stuff like that and working with groups and all that. And I, I mean, it's something that I, I don't do anything unless I love to do it. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it's also like, it's great for them. It's great for the people you work with. It's great for you. It's like, um, like I have very, very selfish, um, aspirations around dopey like i don't do like people always tell me how great it is that i'm helping people blah 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 i don't even consider dopey to be i don't do dopey to help anybody i do dopey because i really really loved i always wanted to have a talk show and i get to have this talk show it just so happened that i wound up having to become a heroin addict getting clean having my friends die and now it's this thing but i did it because i love to do it you know what i mean i did it because and also because i want it to be something like i want it to be big i don't want it to be like saving people it's it's like the byproduct of it being good is that people feel something from it which is awesome um with yeah, you. I look at it like the byproduct. Of, you know, like at first when the pandemic came, I mean, I canceled like thirty shows. I was right. like, "Fuck!" Like this is a big hit. You know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna be able to do the. Couldn't do my St. Patty's Day show, and now it's like one of those. It's a thing. Like I told you, with I believe in the universe and stuff. It gave me a hard pause. It made me realize like I'm chasing the bag around the world all the time. And it's like, you know, going in to do these groups at Banyan, man, like it's been, you know, I'm, I'm working with people who are like 17 days sober or 30 days and telling them, I mean, that's the way it works is we help other people. And, and, um, and especially because like meetings have been shut down. It's like moved to Zoom, which really doesn't, it's it not feels the same. Weird. It feels weird. It's not the same. So I really need that like one-on-one connection with people. And uh, so that's been great. I mean, I've enjoyed this year, dude. This has been like, you know, I've been at home seeing my son all the time. You know, I got, uh, I got back with, with my girlfriend and I mean, her, I'm just, you know, She's a great girl. So I mean, I I just been happy, dude. Well, good been deal. Happy. I'm happy you're happy. How long How long did it take for the higher power thing to click in your head when you got sober? I tell people it was the hardest thing. It took me 18 years. That's why it took me 18 years to get sober. You know what I mean? I was like, nah, nah. So I mean, I just started with the universe, and since then it's kind of expanded. Like I read a lot of. I'm, I'm big on the Eckhart Tolle uh, and New Earth type of stuff. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, I just believe in that shit because I've seen it work in my life now. But I, I mean, I resisted it for a long time. Yeah, I mean, me too. And uh, I took it because I felt like I had to. Like, I wouldn't be thoroughly following it unless I decided that I was going to do it. You know, if I wasn't going <laughs> to yeah. claim a higher power for myself. Now, um, again, I appreciate your time. And the great currency of Dopey is the fucked up Dopey story. And before we started, you were like, I don't know, I don't have a story, blah, blah, blah. We've talked for about an hour. And I know how your brain works. you got different people in your brain doing work on the side. I'm sure you came up with something (laughs) as we talked. You got one for us? Yeah, I you know I didn't think about it in advance, but you know, and and I hesitate to even tell the story, but I'm going to tell it. Anyway and before because I don't before like... you even tell it though, the shit story was great. That would have counted for me. Just so you know, that would have counted that for was the a, Dopey story. Yeah, that was okay. For <laughs> yeah, that's a lame story. That's a pathetic story. But you know, I I always hesitate because you know, generally speaking, I was always to, able to pull it together and stay sober to shoot movies and almost every movie I've done. And uh, because there's such big opportunities that I valued so much, I would get like a sponsor with me and like fucking just make sure I was, you know, on point for that stuff. Because it's, you know, a movie day is a long day. It's like 12 hours. You can't get fucked up and shoot movies. You know what I'm saying? Like, and it's not only highly frowned on, they would have to insure you for millions of dollars because if you fuck up, like you have to start shooting the whole movie over again. So I've always been very careful of that. Or, but... You know, I was doing one movie and I was in Canada and, uh, fuck man, you know, it was, it was a horror movie. It was called Girl House and I had to wear a mask. You know, I play like the serial killer. It's a slasher movie. And, um, anyways, most of it was shot without me in the mask because I was shooting another movie at the same time called By the Gun. But I went up there and I shot all the parts without the mask. But then they were like, you know, I said, I'll stick around for a couple more days and not going to be shooting for a few more days and I'll do some of the stuff with the mask so the mask fit the other guy that they fit it for because it wasn't supposed to be me so 
it's like really fucking tight and uncomfortable and it ties on the back of my head and I can't like it's it's not easy to take on and off. I have to have like the makeup artist take it on and off. Right. But one night I'm on set and it's like 12 fucking hours before they get to my scene. It's five in the morning and I fucking got this bag of uh, Molly of MDMA from this kid that I know up there. <clears throat> And I'm like, fuck, we're not even going to get to shoot my scene. I've been sitting here all fucking night, right? I'm in the wardrobe and everything. I don't have the mask on, but whatever. I go, I'm going to take a little bit of this Molly just to get me through the night. You know, just to get me through the end of the night. So I fucking, I take some of it. And I would take it all the time. So it was nothing for me to, like, take it before an interview or whatever I had to do. Like, I wasn't, like, visibly high generally. All I was able to just kind of rock with it. I was used to being high all the time. But this shit wasn't MDMA, man. It wasn't fucking Molly. It wasn't MDMA. This, I think, was bath salts because I was so fucked up. I mean, like, it was like a digital fucking world suddenly, instantly. And I felt so sick, dude. I go, I'm throwing up in the fucking toilet. Everything is like, you know. And then they're like, I thought we're not gonna get to my scene. I'm like, there's only an hour or two left. Like I got, and fucking. Then they sure enough call me in to do the scene with the fucking mask tied on my head, dude. I can't see through the mask. I can't take the fucking mask. Now I'm sweating profusely like fucking Michael Jordan in the fourth quarter, dude. Like it's just pouring down my head and my eyes. My hands are shaking. People's voices are like, you know, like slow mo, rule, rule, slow motion, high pit, you know, fluctuating back and forth. I can't see out of the mask. And they're like, you got to walk up behind the couple on the couch there. You're going to stand behind them and then you're going to walk up the stairs, right? I mean, simplest thing you could possibly do, gargantuan task. I'm so fucking high, dude. And there's 40 fucking people are shooting in this mansion and everybody's staring and I'm like, feel all the eyeballs on me and the director, action! And I'm walking <laughs> out behind the fucking thing. Dude, I'm so, I can't even put one foot in front of the other. I'm like hobbling. I'm like a fucking robot. <laughs> Stop behind them. They're like making out about to have sex on the couch and I take a right to go up the stairs and I'm just so fucking high. And so, all right, cut. All right, we got to do it again. So the director comes up to me. His face is like fucking morphing and all this shit. I, I don't know what I took, dude. I was so, so I told him, dude, I think I have food poisoning. I ate something bad. I need to get this mask off. I have one take left in me. <laughs> I have one take left in me, and then I, and then I gotta go. And he's like, oh shit, really, man? I was like, dude, I'm really fucking sick right now. Let's do this fucking shot and get what you need, and then that's it. So we did it. And then I went back to the hotel, and I had to get my girlfriend on fucking uh, FaceTime or whatever, or Skype, whatever it was at that time. And I was like, you need to watch me. I was, I was violently ill for the next 24 hours. I was like, you need to make sure that I don't die. Like, I kept her on Skype with me while I was on the fucking thing, dude. And, oh, my God, it was a fucking nightmare like the, it was horrifying it was horrifying the mask just tied to my head it's choking me i can't fucking see Crazy. and the pressure is on me to do this fucking scene dude it was, it was terrifying oh my god well you came through with the story and like uh i wonder what the fuck baths i mean like just the name bath salts is such a weird thing like what is in there I don't know, dude, but this was... I've never had a reaction like this to anything. I mean, it was brutal. It was right. brutal. Slane, you're a good man. Thank you for coming on the show. It, it's been a pleasure for me. I can't believe I just told that story. I'm going to regret that. Why? No, right. <laughs> Listen, if you need me to take it out, I'll take it out. But uh, it's, it's, okay. it's not... That's, that's Give me a break. So you, you ate something bad on set. You had a terrible mask. It was, come on. It's fun. <laughs> I, I like the shitting in between the cars. I think that's funny it, as hell. It actually, it actually looks cool though when I watch that movie back. Like it, it actually played well because I have the like I look like I'm fucking like this deranged monster. killer. Well, you look, were. Yeah, I look like a deranged killer. So I guess we chalk it up to uh, method acting. There you go. There you go. Um, dude, thank you though. It was. Uh, did you enjoy your experience on the Dobby podcast? <laughs> Yes, I did, man. Thanks for having me on. Um, are you going to do a podcast? I saw you post that you're going to do a podcast. 
Yeah, I'm working on it. I just want it to be good and not lame. So, you know. I hear you. Um, all right. If you ever need anything from me, I'm always around. I'm just trying to figure out, like, the right way to do it. So, you know, I mean, like, I want it to be unique and different, and I'm not going to launch one until I'm ready for it to be, you know. I just, it takes me four years to record an album, and so, and I, and I have the songs already, and I'm I'm just tweaking everything. So I'm kind of, talk about character defects, perfectionism is a motherfucker for me. That's interesting. I mean, I could have gone for a lot longer, actually, because one thing I want to ask you about, too, and I'll probably cut this in someplace, with character defects, right? You do, yeah. you, you, make a, you make a list of your resentments or, or you, you make a list of your character defects and you, and you pray to have them removed. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine who, who had just done his, uh, he did four through nine in an afternoon, kind of like an old school kind of thing. And yeah. he said, I mean, when I did my, my steps, my character defects kind of came back pretty quickly. And, uh, and he said literally that afternoon, his character defects kind of came back. Like his, it was like his five o'clock shadow grew in after <laughs> the shave kind of thing. Like, what do you do about that? Well, I mean, you know, the way I understand them, and there, there isn't much in like in the big book about uh, six and seven. It's like one paragraph. So like in the 12 and 12, which I prefer that book because it's like written 15 years later, there's a lot more experience in the, in the steps. Um, also in the traditions, I'm not even sure I'm supposed to be talking about this on a podcast, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> if it helps somebody, you know, that's of primary importance anyways. But uh, the way I look at it with the, with the defects is like, you know, some of our defects we like, you know, it says that in there too. Like we don't, we're not ready to let go of them. Right. You know what I'm saying? But we just got to be willing to let go of them. It's progress, not perfection, man. I mean, it's willing, human yes. beings, human being, you're not going to be wiped clean, clean and white as snow, pure of your addiction and alcoholism and all your defects of character and go on to be a saint. I mean, people say that to me too. Like, do you even have any vices anymore? It's like, bro. I smoke cigarettes. I drink six cups of coffee a day. I fucking I love to play poker. I fu- you know, and I could go on. I'm, I'm just, and, you know, I get, yeah. I get it, man. I get it. All right. Um, I appreciate that, man. I appreciate it, the whole thing. Thank you for coming through. Uh, yeah, dude. All right. So I really enjoyed Slane. I, I he was a, a nice guy and like fun to talk to and. Uh, Anybody who's happy to be on the show, I'm incredibly happy to have on the show. Yeah, that doesn't happen that often that somebody wants to be on the show for years and then they finally come on. I don't think he wanted to be on the show for years. I think he said people have been hollering at him about Dopey, and then when I asked, he was like, yeah, I'll do it, whatever. Um, I, don't think, I don't think he was pining to come on. Though. But he knew about it, and he knew he was a good fit for it. Exactly. But I think also he was close with Danny Boy O'Connor yeah. from House of Pain. Yeah, Danny Boy told him about this. Basically. And no, but there's a bunch of fans who had reached out to me oh, and to him. Oh, I see. Which is always fun when the fans connect us with uh, yeah. the, the good dopey celebrity stories. So I thought Slane, um, I don't know, I thought he was great. I thought his stuff at the end, talking about the mm-hmm. steps, so like, mm-hmm. I, I think this is because I can understand things better, but I thought he was great talking about that. And I was, I was just listening this morning, and I was like, I understand what he's saying, which when I first started, I would go to meetings, and I couldn't understand people at all. I, when they would be talking, I just heard, like, the snoopy. Womp, 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 womp. That's what I heard. Womp, 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 womp. And, um... Yeah, I mean, I, I, I love being, uh, it's, it's fucked up because I listened to old episodes of the show where I was so against uh, program and shit. Or like, I think I was just excited that I finally understood it. And now I'm like so into it um, because my life is, is so much better than it was. I mean, my life was so fucking bad. I, I went on this podcast uh, last week called Sober Sex. I was yeah. I was very prudish you on sober sex. I was very prudish on sober listen. sex. But um just to tell the story, you know, like obviously I tell bits of the story on on the dopey all the time and I don't I don't really tell my life story to people all the time in my personal life and to tell the story of like my mother dying and and, and Linda getting pregnant and relapsing and then 
and then having to get clean and then Chris dying, hearing it all at once, it's like, holy shit, I've, I've actually been through something. Oh, yeah. You know, and Todd dying. It's like, it's, it's like, holy shit, I've actually been through something. And, and, when, and it's like, I can forget that. And my life is like so different now. You know what I mean? Like, like I'm comfortable. Like, like the other day I went downstairs and, and my fucking sink broke, flooded the kitchen. And I'm like calling people at six thirty in the morning and nobody's coming. And then at seven thirty the plumber came and he priced out a sink and I could pay for it. Yeah. And it was like, holy shit, I'm, I'm a grown up and, buying a sink. And I guess the price pretty accurately. So then you felt like you didn't get ripped off. Yeah. I mean, my problem was solved and it was because I could solve the problem, which is only because I, I'm not a drug addict. I mean, the problem used to be, how can I not get sick? Right. You know, and now the problem is I can get a sink fix. When people complain that the show has changed, they're like, what do you expect? Like, life changes. Things change. Nothing stays the same. If it stayed the same, then it wouldn't be good. Well, people are, are fucking dumb. And then this brings us to the next segment of the show, which is one of my favorite segments of the show. Oh, and you guys shouldn't do it, even though it is one of my favorite segments of the show, is to read a negative review that just came in while we were doing the show. And Dave said it broke my heart. I'm like, I'm not bothered at all. You're the Please, one. Please, I saw you. You're shook. Ray <laughs> got shook when he heard this No, one. I was waiting to see if they right. said something about me. They did. They did, and it wasn't bad. It wasn't good. Anyway, here we go. The, the review says, best guest ever, five stars, which is trying to lull me in, I think. And he says, or she says, the show has gone downhill since Chris's death 28 months ago or something. Yeah, and you're still listening, you fucking idiot. There you go, Ray. Let him know. And I'm disappointed. I used to tune in weekly, excited to hear Chris's hilarity, but I no longer get excited anymore. But he listens. He's not excited, but he's listening. Chris is dead. Wow, Chris has been dead for a long time. Um, This shit makes me... It seems like all Dave wants to do is interview famous musicians. And if that's what he wants to do, power to him. Which doesn't make any sense. It'd be more power to him, you fucking idiot. But I don't think it would be deserving of the name Dopey. All right, listen. Guess who named the show Dopey, you fucking idiot? Crystals? Do you think you named the show Dopey? No. I named the show Dopey. And what, are you going to change the name of the show? Not Dopey. Well, here we go. Yeah, maybe the show should be called Not Dopey now. And it says, good for Ray for saying no to co-hosting. As great as he is, it wouldn't help the show. Because I'm too old. Because you're too old. <laughs> you need someone younger to bring back some life to the podcast. Bring back the Dopey toodles. All right, yeah, motherfucker. Yeah. Let's see what you're doing when you're 60 years old. Oh, no, just calm down. You don't, know, you don't know my life before COVID. I was out every fucking, like, I had a wild life. Ray was fucking 69 in cops on the <laughs> sixth floor of his walk-up. Come He's, to a rainbow show. Ray see was fucking eating Viagra and 69ing for 10 hours, Crystal. What are you doing? He's fucking eating pubes and licking urine. What are you up to? He's showering in his clothes. But bring back the dopey toodles. It's like, I hate to say this like this, but Chris died. You know, he didn't leave. He didn't start a better podcast. He died. So the show, I decided to make the show go on. I say this all the time, but it it hurts my feelings every time. And if Chris was alive, the show would be different now. I think that's a very good point. So thank you, Crystals, uh, for the review, and fuck you. And um, thank you for really giving it five stars, though. At least it's not another one star review yeah. on the on the on the record. And if you're gonna chip in with a review because we want to get to the two thousand reviews, just please don't say that kind of stuff. Or make sure you do five stars. But honestly, Crystals, if the show was as as bad as you think it is, would we be number one in El Salvador and number three in Croatia? Yep. Number nine in Brazil? I can't wait for this world tour. Anyway, Crystals, write me an email at dopeypodcast at gmail.com. Everybody else, um, fucking please... Watch them call it. What do I want them to do? Write a review. Write a review. Follow us five on Instagram. Star. All that shit. Um, predict a five million download. I want to read an email I got that I found very meaningful. Like not a dick. Like crystals. If cr- crystals is a dude who probably smokes crystals, is what it is. That's what it is. <laughs> Crystal. Yeah, but it's crystals with a K. Anyway, this That's is like um, a hamburger. This is what's that? Crystal hamburgers. What is that? It's in Florida. What is that? It's like a cha- hamburger chain. It's like White Castle. All right. Th- thank you, Ray. Um, 
So, Ray, you want to read the email? I'll try. Here we go. Hold on. It's from a dopey fan named Caitlin. Don't give me shit if I have trouble. I'll try. Hi, Dave. My name is Caitlin. I'm a longtime listener. You read an email a few years back of mine with Chris about shooting up spit. I just wanted to say that your podcast really saved my life. I was listening for a while in the beginning and then relapsed. I was sent a, to a couple of long-term programs in between 2018 and 2020, one being in the old Renaissance building that you went to that is now Samaritan Village, I believe. Uh-huh. I now have my first year clean ever without being in treatment, in a treatment center and have been listening from the beginning again. I just finished the episode with Artie Lang, and hearing him mention your friend Todd broke my heart. It broke my heart, too, uh, Caitlin. I know how it feels to lose people from this horrible disease. In fact, my ex-boyfriend overdosed and died after getting shit from Schenectady like Todd did. I live in Albany. I'm, I also am sorry about Chris. I added Chris on Facebook when I first started listening, but unfortunately, I never got a chance to send a message to him. Anyways, I'm rambling, but I want you to know that you saved my life, and without you and Chris, I would never have thought I could have had a good life sober. Thank you, Dave, and fucking toodles for Chris. Thank you, Caitlin, and thank you, Ray. That was a fine read. Very nice. I feel like I'm in school sometimes with all of the shit. You're like, listen to this interview. It's like, here's your homework, and then I have to come here and read, and like... And yet here you are. I hate school. You know, I recently looked at my messages with Chris. You know, Chris and I weren't, like, super good friends, but we, we had messages, and it was weird to, like, see our correspondence, and I never got to tell him. I listened to this song, Bull Weevil, by the Presidents of the United States, which we were arguing on the show I did. I was saying that that song was based on the traditional song, Bull Weevil, and he was like, I don't think so, and I was adamant. I'm like... I'm sure it is. And I listened, and he was right. Well, that's the first thing Chris has ever been right about in terms of music. <laughs> he thought Prince played in the band Queen. You yes. know? He, he, like, but it doesn't matter. Um, I love hearing from the old-time dopey people, so, Caitlin, thank you for sending that in. I've heard from a bunch of old-time dopey people since I asked for the uh, old-time dopey people to reach out. And I had a conversation with Randy, uh, who has just gotten four years clean, and he actually got sober from listening to Dopey. It's amazing. And um, he had me speak at his uh, CA meeting this week. Oh, yeah? So I went on a Zoom. What is C- that, cocaine? Yeah, Cocaine Anonymous. And it was like I was going to lie and say how much I loved Coke, but I, but I couldn't get myself to do it. Did you take me to that... Uh, the marijuana anonymous I meeting. Think you too. I used to go to a lot of MA meetings because Why? because my sponsor is like was a huge pothead and he likes to and MA meetings are hilarious. You took me to that one at the LGBT yes, center. Yes, yeah. They're so funny cuz everybody's like has one day sober cuz cuz marijuana doesn't ruin your life so people just constantly go in and, and they laugh everything. They all seem like they're high. Oh, they're I, always laughing. But uh this week is super um, program week because I spoke at the CA meeting on Monday. Tomorrow, I'm going to a fucking rehab on Long Island and speaking to like a detox in or real life. In real life, and then Saturday, I'm speaking at a online meeting uh, in Los Angeles for you, Aurora. You never tell me about these. I would, I would come on. You would? I would watch. I don't want to bother you. I hate to. I hate to be a burden on you, Ray. I, it seems like I ruin your life making you listen and read and Actually, maybe, stuff. Maybe I wouldn't because you didn't come to my. Oh, here we my, go. Uh, um, your dopey, uh, your dopey, dopey Zoom. <laughs> you didn't remind me, and I was I was doing this oh, and that. Your child was in the hospital. Was she? Yeah. No, she wasn't. She was sick. She was sick. Oh yeah. Before before we go, I want to check in on uh, on Ray's ever going fourth step. Oh my God. How so? So. Explain to the Dopey Nation what you've been working on. I don't know. I'm. I, I got to talk to my sponsor. I'm having like weird feelings. It's like it's. I'm doing this ongoing fourth step um, test. You have been legitimately doing right. it for like fifteen weeks. Yeah, and legitimately. I, and I keep expecting him to go at the end. Psych. That was actually the real one. But I said that to him yesterday, and he's like, "No, there, this is." This is just the test. Explain explain what you're saying a little um, bit more. I write down five resentments, so like uh, who the person was, what happened, uh, what that, uh, what that uh, caused in me, and then what my character defect in relationship 
too that was. I, but but what I'm but Ray's getting at though is that his sponsor has him writing a test fourth step literally since the summer you've been writing this it's paid like 20 pages now and and that's not i think a thorough fourth step is a great thing the thing that's crazy is that when you're done with this he's going to make you do it again yeah but no way i said i'm running out of material and he's like you'll be surprised and he's like you need to start putting you like you are the person like i'm mad at myself because of this so maybe you're not doing it right maybe you're failing the test that's what he said last night he's like from going ongoing from now can you start doing this about yourself and i told him that thing about the guy who said his his character defects started growing back like his beard and he's like that's because he didn't do it properly he didn't do it thoroughly i don't know i'm i'm it's causing me some like it sounds like your sponsor got needs to get added to the list Maybe. I put you on the list again last night. Why last night? Because of that video thing. Which video thing? I sent you a video, and then you, like, sent it to Hollywood and, like, made, a, like, a slick version. I'm like, <laughs> you fucking stole my idea. You're, you're a sick fucking person. <laughs> I put, like, a, right. a, a bunch of people. I don't want to ruin DopeyCon 2, but Ray wrote an amazing song for DopeyCon 2, and he didn't want to perform the song live, so he made this video with people in the Dopey Nation, and it's like the worst video in the history of videos. It's not. It's like the most unprofessional video. It's like... Well, not, I made it on iMovies. It's, it's not good. It's and bad. Then, but then uh, Dave took elements of that and sent it to Hollywood, and it came back very slick. Really, uh, a really cool you're video. Like, you are a delusional person. <laughs> you are a deluded there, person. You have to admit, there's elements in mine that showed up in yours. You got the elements in yours from the dopey well, that's page. True. Like, <laughs> you that's got them from me in like, the first if place. If you're going to make a dopey video, it's going to have the same content. So basically you're saying, I stole my pictures <laughs> yes. from you that you took from me. Because you would never have thought to have d- done that if you hadn't you're seen a mine. Sick, I think your, cost is, your sponsor's right. So you've right. been on there three times now. Your sponsor's right. You're not doing the step <laughs> right. You need to look at yourself. You need to look at yourself. Well, I don't know. I you got to put crystals on the list. Crystals, you're she's on go- the list. She's going on the list. <laughs> but um, thank you, Ray, for coming to the house and doing another exciting. And I got another famous musician on for crystals too. Yeah, that's the all fuck? you want to do. That's all you're interested fucking in. Fucking crystals, man. <laughs> it's like what the fuck. It's like how much time do, does crystals have? What is crystals doing that they need to get online? Fucking write a review. Sad life. Put me down. A sad, sad life. I don't. I don't even understand it. It's like it, it just doesn't make sense to me. Anyway. Well, this was this was. We had big plans for today, and we wound up doing a small portion of them. Well, we do. What we can do. It's fun. Stay. Oh, Ray, you you end the show. Oh, stay strong, Dopey Nation. Fucking toodles for Chris. Can you take me off your list, please? You're on the list. You can't come off. The take list. me off the list. <laughs> And stay strong, Dopey Nation. And fucking toodles for Chris. I want to take a walk around the world. I wonder would it do me any good. But until I get some money in my pocket, then I guess...
but still My shadow's getting smaller and smaller And it's high noon where I stand I wonder would they pay me any mind If I leave this busted city far behind And I'll take the high road However far it winds Cause peace and love are very, very, very hard to find And I wanna be good so bad I wanna be so good, so bad, so bad I wanna be good so bad The bad desire's all I've ever had Oh man, these suckers really It's all